Well, good morning. Welcome to Trinity. We're excited to have you here with us this morning as we worship the Lord together, whether you are here in the room or joining us online. We're just excited about all that God is doing here in our midst, and we want to give, uh, extend a special welcome to all of our fathers. Happy Father's Day. Um, whether you um, are spending the day with your kids or whether you have been a spiritual father, a mentor to someone, we want to just um, say thank you and uh, offer our, our thanks to you and your commitment to your to your kids. And I also want to just extend a special word to those um, who may have grown up maybe not knowing your father, not having much of a relationship with your father, want to just say in this place that you have a heavenly father that loves you, that has unconditional love for you, that is walking with you, that pursues you, and so as we celebrate Father's Day, we are going to give glory and praise to our Heavenly Father this morning. Amen? Amen. So I invite you to stand now with me and join in the call to worship. And I will make notes. Um, this is one of those call to worships with exclamation points. And uh, you don't have to be an English major to know when you see an exclamation point at the end of a phrase that means a little extra. And this one, you just say the same thing over and over for the most of it. So hopefully we can build with excitement as we um, enter into this time of worship together. So let me begin. Come, let us praise God together. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's tell stories of God's power and majesty, his mighty acts throughout history. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's remember the compassion he has shown toward us, his mercy and unfailing love, generation after generation. For God is great and worthy of our praise. Let's pass these stories along to our children and grandchildren so that they too may come to know and love our God. For God is great and worthy of our praise. And all together... Let's worship God together. So now we'll join in song singing, Holy God, we praise thy name, hymn number 19.
for the opportunity, the privilege, and honor it is to be in your house, gathered as a people, to give you the praise that you deserve. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you more for who you are, that you are mighty, that you are great, that you are sustaining, and that you supply to us a great Redeemer in Jesus Christ. May all that we say and do this morning bring you happiness and joy. May it fill your heart. We pray in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day again to those of you that are fathers, act like a father, stepfather, or fulfill that role in some way. We celebrate you today. Just a few announcements. Oh, please make sure you pass the black books that are on the inside rows so that we know you were here. Those of you online, if you could go to uh, the website, there is something called the Connect Card. It lets us know you are worshiping with us online as well. Or just put a comment in the Facebook, uh, the comment area. We'll also know you were there as well. Uh, we will be taking a deacon's offering at the end of our service today. There will be a basket outside the door. Uh, for Go ahead. Oh, is it next week? I thought we said next week. <laughs> okay, it's next week. <laughs> My few announcements, I, I mix them up. Um, there is an exec board this Tuesday at 6 p.m. Um, if there's any, there's not many exec board members here, but I have a paper for you. Please come see me if you're here by the, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of church. You, saw, you can see in the, announce, in the bulletin today there is the Windy City Thunderbolts game. Um, we would like to do a Trinity outing. It's June 27th. You can see the details. It's cheap, 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 $2, $2, $2. Hopefully you can all come. We can go as a church group. It's a fun time. If you've ever been to one, they, you know, bring your grandkids, bring, you know, your kids can bring their friends. They do a lot of really fun, silly things. And you get to watch a baseball game. And there, I don't, are there fireworks? Do you know? Not that night. Okay, not that night. Um, also, this is something we are thinking of doing June 30th. Evergreen Park has their annual fireworks display, and we, are, we used to come out on the field, and, and lots of uh, neighborhood people come and watch the fireworks. If you would be interested in coming and kind of being a host, maybe we'd have some water, some popsicles, kind of a thought out there. If you would be interested in coming to Trinity that night, June 30th, um, to maybe help out. We're not really sure. It's kind of in the works. Let Pastor Tom know that you would be interested in coming. We're just kind of getting a feel if it's something that we are able and want to do. So please uh, see him short, soon if you plan on doing or would like to do that. Um, and also, that's one more time, the summer Bible study is continuing on Wednesday. Um, hopefully we see some of you there that haven't been able to visit with us. Any other announcements? One quick thing. One quick thing. Uh, so I'm looking out. It looks like I haven't had my V8 today because th this side of the room looks pretty full. This side of the room. And also, um, sh I, I showered this morning. Did you shower this morning? The, the beginning of the, the first few rows, like we can come closer. So I love the fact that we have more people sitting together. But um, feel free during the Pass in the Peace, if you want to move to the good seats, um, you can... You, they're not reserved or anything. You are welcome to come sit as close as you like to sit. Uh, we did all shower this morning, I think. So. There's a gift under your pew. <laughs> um, all right, now is our time to pass the peace to one another. As Jesus has shared his peace with each of us, let us now share that peace with each other. We ask you to get up, move around, and take a few moments to greet each other with a sign of God's peace.
Well, it is wonderful to see the sounds of community. So uh, we invite you to uh, return back to your seats or perhaps a new seat up in the first few. Uh, they're open. Um, but we are going to transition in our time of worship this morning. You know, it's like herding cats. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you can be seated. If you want to come closer, you can. I'm not going to shame you anymore, though, so, you know, sit wherever you want to sit. <laughs> uh, but we are going to continue to worship. Man, Rita, don't get on Rita's bad side. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, friends, um, as we consider um, how God is leading us to invest in his kingdom, uh, this is our time to do that in the service. Um, since we do not pass the plates anymore, um, this is a time for us to consider not just how we might invest in God's work uh, financially, but also just with our lives, our time, our talent, our treasure. Um, if you do um, contribute to Trinity Church financially, there is an offering box on the way out. You can donate via cash or check there. Also, you can donate whether you're online or here on site at trinityecc.org, right at the bottom of our front page. There is a button where you can give online. And also I want to just mention um, children's ministry. If you look around, we um, don't have a ton of kiddos yet. I want to use the word yet. But we want to prepare to grow. That's part of the conversation about where we sit and the conversations about um, how we, you know, the things that we invest our time into, we want to grow. We want to welcome people into our church. And so I know that we have some faithful, faithful folks who rotate through um, the children's ministry and the nursery, and we so appreciate your investment, but they could use some relief so that there can be a rotation. So if God is tugging at your heart to be a part of the children's ministry, you can also write in that black book, contact me about children's ministry, or come talk to one of us um, afterwards. Um, we would love to talk to you about... Um, yeah, caring for our kiddos, welcome, making an environment where they feel welcome. And so as we continue to worship this morning, uh, we are working through um, the, the seven letters to the seven churches in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. And we talk a lot about the supremacy of Christ. And so as we talked about God the Father and the supremacy of Christ, we are going to sing in Christ alone. So please stand with us as we sing this morning. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of seated. That's right. We did forget the doxology. So let's sing the doxology. I think we should do that before... morning. Let's uh, join me in prayer. Father God, thank you this morning for your love for us, for your grace, for your forgiveness. Thank you for being our good, good Father who loves us, who has saved us, who pursues us in relationship. And God, I think about um, the many in our congregation who are struggling, who are fighting different diseases, different ailments, different struggles, God. I think about Antonia Becerra, Lord, who lost her brother, mourning, the, mourning his life and, and, and the funeral that they had down in Puerto Rico, Lord, and just now that she's back and, and moving into this next chapter, Lord, might she experience your love and your grace and your embrace. God, I think about Orrin Swift also, Lord, who was at another funeral, down in New Orleans this past week and just got back last night. We're grateful that he's here with us this morning, Lord, but no, he has been through such a journey, Lord. Might he know your grace and your love as well. I've got to think about my sister Rita Stober, Lord, who's again with us this morning, Lord, but I know is, has some significant procedures on the horizon, Lord. And Father, um, there are so many other um, struggles that we have, Lord, that I could list, could go on and on and on. And God, we take confidence that you conquered death on the cross to give us hope of new life. We take confidence in the fact, God, that, um, that you love us, that you've forgiven us, God, that you give us the opportunity for new life, a fresh start, new hope. That, God, you are on the throne, even when our world seems to be upside down and out of control, that you are on the throne, and we declare that, God, this morning. So we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, praying the prayer that he taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Remain standing for the reading of God's word. Revelation 2, 12 through 17. To the angel of the church of Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. 
Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. This is the word of the Lord. Now you may be seated. And I don't know if I was so excited to just preach a sermon this morning that we just skipped half the service, but you know, it happens sometimes. Well, good morning again, and excited to continue this series that we have been um, working through these, the open letter to the church. And these are letters that Jesus communicated through his servant John at the end of the first century to seven churches on the western bank of modern-day Turkey. And we'll see that map on the screen. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. Um, we're at the top of the, the loop this morning in Pergamum, right there on the coast. This is the northernmost city that we'll go to. And um, this is part of a loop, a message, messages that were shared by messenger God gave through Jesus Christ a vision to John exiled on Patmos, an island down there just off the coast he, who was exiled by the Roman government. And Jesus gives him this message that he brings throughout this kind of horseshoe loop through the seven churches. And the idea behind all of it is that we are designed to be a light in the darkness. And we have a photo of lanterns. That is what we must think about. You think if those of you who grew up going to Sunday school and sung the song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to Let It Shine, that's what we're talking about. Is that in our world, our broken world, the world that is full of despair and full of darkness, that we are shining our light of Christ's love, of the hope of Christ, of the hope of the resurrection that we bring light, we bring refreshment, we bring hope, we bring Christ's love to our world. And that is the target. And so when we think about how are we doing as Trinity Church, we can listen to and learn from these letters that we've been going through. We're essentially reading the mail of these other churches, but this is very fitting because that's how it would have worked originally that all of the churches would have heard all of the letters so they can learn from both the victories and also the struggles of each church. So just as Jesus says, those who have ears, let them hear. Are you listening to the word? This is not uh, his, just a historical survey, and I would say the same thing every week at our Bible study on Wednesdays, that we're not just doing a historical survey to, to gain interesting information about ancient Rome or uh, the ancient... Um, kingdoms of the world. No, we are, we are learning from their lessons so that we might be faithful in our service to the living God. Amen? Amen. So this morning we are in Revelation chapter 2, if you have a Bible in front of you. Uh, we also post our notes in the events section of the YouVersion Bible app each week, uh, but I encourage you to follow along as we work through this letter from Jesus to the church in Pergamum, which starts in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12. To the angel of the church of Pergamum writes, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. And we were talking about this at Bible study on Wednesday that Jesus presents himself in many different ways throughout the book of Revelation, maybe most strikingly as a lion and a lamb. And we talked about lions being ferocious, being intimidating. They're the king of the jungle. They're not easily tamed, which is why as uh, C.S. Lewis chooses a lion to represent his Christ figure in the Chronicles of Narnia when he presents Aslan as a lion. And, and the, the famous thing that's said about Aslan is he's not safe, but he's good. But we talk, when we talk about Jesus, that portrayal is unique. Our, our um, reading of the Chronicles of Narnia and stories like that stand out to us because we're not used to seeing Jesus in that way. We're used to seeing Jesus as the Lamb, the Lamb who conquered death on the cross. But as Jesus presents himself in this passage, he presents himself as one whose voice cuts through distractions and pretense to get to the truth. That the word of God 
sometimes cuts. It sometimes sharp. It sometimes provokes us and challenges us as much as it comforts us. And last week I talked about the letter that we studied last week is more of a pastoral, more of a caring woman. The Smyrna Christians were struggling. They were barely hanging on. And so that is the word that Jesus brings. But in this case, this is a church that is struggling to stay faithful to Jesus. And so they require a word of encouragement and a word of challenge. So he continues on in verse 13. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. I want to talk about this. Uh, There's a lot in this verse, especially when it says, that you live where Satan has his throne. And you might picture in your mind, well, what do you mean where Satan has his throne? Well, Pergamum was the center of emperor worship, was a center, was a center of the worship of many of the Greco-Roman deities in the ancient world. And just as the Apostle Paul walks through the city of Athens and is troubled by the amount of gods being worshipped, you could say the same thing for Pergamum. And specifically, in Pergamum, there was a very famous statue to Zeus, who, if you studied mythology in school growing up, Zeus was the king of all gods, living up on Olympus. And we have a a picture of this is what remains. We have little pieces that, were, uh, that remain of this huge statue. And you notice Zeus is in the middle with a beard and he's got a serpent's tail. Now again, for those who have ears, let them hear. In the Bible, serpents are not a positive image. Going right back to the very beginning of the Bible in the Garden of Eden... Adam and Eve were tempted by a serpent, right? Because the serpent was sneaky. The serpent was tricky. The serpent would present something to you that might draw you in before that serpent would strike. And you're going to see that that imagery is with, throughout the book of Revelation to become on Wednesday nights or Wednesday afternoons through the course of the summer, you'll see a serpent and a dragon. Whenever you see a serpentine kind of figure, that is something that is danger, Will Robinson. Uh, We've got some evil at work. And it's interesting that that just happened to be the image that the ancient Greeks chose um, when they depicted Zeus. And so as Christians saw this statue, they said, beware, beware of that false god of Zeus who people were coming and bringing offerings to and you might think well you know what's the big deal the Greeks have their gods we have our god you know but that isn't how it worked in the ancient world there was a lot of pressure to compromise faith in Christ alone or faith in God alone and to be worshiping of all sorts of deities To the point where Christians were getting arrested, especially about within the next 20 years from when this was written, 20 or 30 years, the heat gets turned up and up and up and up. And the Romans and the Greco-Roman people did not know what to make of these Christians who were dedicated to Christ and Christ alone. They didn't understand why they wouldn't worship at the feet of the emperor or worship at the feet of Zeus or worship at the feet of these different deities. And so they were kind of problem people. And so they would, they would bring them in. And we know this because we have documentation outside of Scripture. We have other ancient documents that we can see where this is happening. Matter of fact, we have a letter that's been preserved between a governor named Pliny and the emperor Trajan. And Pliny's asking the Emperor Trajan, Trajan would would be in power about 20 or 30 years after the book of Revelation is written um, in the first part of the second century. Pliny says, what do we do with these Christians? And what they would do is they'd try to get them to renounce Jesus. 
Pliny says, I, I ask them if they will curse Christ. And he makes a side note and he says, by the way, the ones who do curse Christ were never Christians in the first place. The ones who renounce their faith were never, I find that they are not. So even the Romans who are these pagan, worshiping this pantheon of gods, they, they can even recognize the real deal. They, will, they, they stay firm with Jesus. The ones who aren't, well, they kind of will renounce Jesus and go on with their lives. And so he, he tells this church in Pergamum, you did not renounce your faith in me. When they, the heat was turned up and the pressure was put on, they didn't renounce their faith. And it even mentions that there's a man named Antipas who was put to death who, because he would not renounce Christ. So he's got that message of encouragement. They had stood firm. But then we get to verse 14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So Balaam is uh, an Old Testament figure that is meant to say, someone who leads you astray, essentially, is what... Um, John is trying to get at, or what Jesus is trying to communicate to John, is that this is someone within their congregation that says, well, I mean, yeah, okay, worship Jesus, but what is it going to hurt? What is it going to hurt if you go to the temple? And, and in future weeks, I think next week and the week after, we're going to get into what was happening it wasn't just going to church. It wasn't just a different denomination. There was all kinds of perversions happening in the worship of these deities. And we, again, we're not going to get into that today. Uh, we'll have to wait till next week on that. But needless to say, be very difficult to retain faithfulness to Jesus, living out the fruits of the Spirit, joy, peace, patience, love, kindness, faithfulness, and participate in this temple culture to these other deities. And so many of them had a difficult choice to make. And I think for us, it's interesting, but, you know, as much as we might as Christians sometimes feel like we are on the outs with culture, that it's very hard to live amongst our culture, I find that our temptations to worship something other than Jesus are much more subtle than what they were facing. But let, me, let me tell you what I mean. I would say, yes, I put my trust in Jesus. Jesus is on the throne no matter what happens to me in my life. But let me tell you, and I'll just share personally, when there are financial troubles or something happens that is an unexpected expense, you better believe I'm tossing and turning in my bed at night wondering what are we going to do, how are we going to do this. Um, I think about that um, probably most of my adult life. If I think about my primary pain point of anxiety and fear, it's about finances, which actually is ridiculous because as Amy and I talk about we have never not been able to pay a bill. We, God, Jesus has never forsaken us. We've always been taken care of. God has always, matter of fact, when we were first married, way back when we were kids, we were 21 years old. We were still college students living in Minnesota. I remember I was an intern working at a small church, smaller than even us. And we had, I think, $14 in our checking account. And we were on our way to church. We needed gas in the car and we needed to buy groceries for the week. And we said, we've got a tide this morning. What are we going to do? So we put $1.40 in the plate. Not knowing what are we going to do. Like we don't have enough money to do the things that we need to do. But we need to be faithful to Jesus. We are going to tithe. And we're going to put our trust in him. Well, it just so happened got done with the service we you know I was playing on the worship team did the benediction we're gathering after service saying hello how nice to see you and a gentleman in the church palms thirty dollars and says go take your wife out for, for for lunch and I said sir we're gonna go buy toilet paper and put gas in my car but thank you very much 
Now, I'm not going to say dollars are going to dramatically drop out of the sky or miraculously drop out of the sky if you tithe, but I do want to say that Jesus is faithful. Jesus knows your situation. Jesus will take care of you. But for some reason, I don't always trust Jesus, if I'm being honest, to take care of me and my needs. I think I've got to worry about them. And so I wonder... What voices are offering you a Jesus and Christianity? What are you tempted to put your trust in, to put your faith in other than Jesus? Or is Jesus enough for you? And this might look a bunch of different ways. It might look at, like the example that um, I just gave you. It might look like, you know, I am one person when I come into this building on a Sunday morning, and I'm a different person. I behave differently. I act differently. I have different set of standards when I go through my week. That's called compartmentalization, and that is a Jesus plus Christianity. Is it just Jesus, or is it Jesus plus I find the same thing, and this might be risky for me to say this morning, but I'm going to say it. And I'll say, just make a a disclaimer. I I believe uh, participating in our democracy and voting for the candidate that you believe in is worthwhile. I'm not saying that, but I am going to say also this. I see so much conversation around election time that if this person wins, we are doomed. And I think... No matter who you vote for, Democrat, Republican, whatever, on election day is Jesus on the throne. And the day after election day is Jesus still on the throne. We put so much of our faith and our trust that this person is going to save us. Now, are are things going to maybe be more difficult or more challenging depending on who wins an election? Well, sure. But is Jesus still on the throne? When you're trying to pay a bill, is Jesus still on the throne? When you're in that hospital bed, is Jesus still on the throne? When you are unemployed, is Jesus still on the throne? Because that's where our true colors are shown. We can say when everything is great and you got money in your bank account, gas in your car, um, bills are all paid, I love you, Jesus. In Christ alone. You know, we're good, but as soon as that past due notice comes, in Christ and visa alone, my hope is, you know, really. I'm, and I'm confessing to you, I'm right with you. We are driving up here today. We're talking about some finances, and I just said to Amy, like, we got to not talk about that. I'm just about, I'm getting ready to go preach a sermon on Christ alone, and we're like talking about this other stuff. Now, do you have to make plans? Do you have to be responsible? Absolutely. But if it is, if you put more of your energy and more of your time and more of your heart into obsessing and worrying about these things, that's a Jesus plus Christianity. Do we, is Jesus enough? Or do we need, does Jesus need a little help from my bank accounts or a president or whoever? Or has Jesus got this, really? It's a good question. And it's a good question for me. I don't say that, I say that for me as well. Because I, like I said, we are all in process, okay? I, no one expects you to come into Trinity and have this all figured out. Needless to say, me. And if that's the case, I should resign immediately Because I'm in process as much as everyone else is. So we get to verse 16. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And all all that means is that if, if you just walk through life saying, that's okay, Jesus is for Sundays, The rest of the week is up to me. Eventually, the words of Jesus, will they had the power to pierce through our facades to get to the heart of our faith. He will test us. He'll give us that spiritual gut check. Am I really enough for you? Am I really enough for you today? Really, really? 
He'll check us. And whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. Now, manna is really interesting. Again, old, there's a ton of Old Testament references in the book of Revelation. Manna is a very fascinating phenomenon in the Old Testament. Because as you had God's freed people in the wilderness, out of, the, out of Egypt, they complain. They'd be better off if we were slaves, they said. And they're out here in the wilderness. Why did God bring us out here to die? Even after they'd walked through the Red Sea. So God humors them. He meets them where they're at. He meets them in their doubts. He meets them in their questions. And he offers them something called manna. And manna is this miraculous sort of crusty bread that just sort of appears in the morning. Praise God. He's got us. He hears your cry. He understands your fears. He understands your anxiety. He meets us in the midst of all of that. But it's really interesting. Because you can't store manna. Manna is for one day. If you try to stockpile manna so that you've got enough during the lean times, it gets moldy and wormy and corrupt. you got to go trust that it's going to be back out there the next day and the next day. And when Jesus talks about the hidden manna, he's saying to us, I am enough. But, but you might have to take it day by day. I am enough for today. What does Jesus say? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough to worry about for itself, which is such a hard verse, especially when you're worrying. If you've ever been really anxious, and you read that passage, do not be anxious, and it makes you more anxious, it's, it happens, right? So he has to remind us, I am just like the manna. I'm fresh today. I will be fresh tomorrow. I'll be fresh the day after that. But you've got to trust me that I'm going to continue to show up in, my, in your life day after day. And he also says, I'll give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now, the white stone is really interesting. White stones were used for at least two purposes in the ancient world. One was, if you were on trial, and they, were, and the, and the, the, they hear your, your uh, testimony, how they would rule in your favor against you. If they held up a white stone, you are innocent. If they hold up a black colored stone, you are guilty. Which means those who are in Christ, Jesus is holding up a white stone towards you and saying, you have been redeemed, you have been forgiven, you have been set free. But also, and this is maybe even more interesting, in some high society parties and gatherings, you would get a white stone with an inscription on it that would be your ticket into the banquet, into the party. So the other significance is for those who are in Christ who say I will give my life to you Jesus I will follow you he gives us the admittance to the party which is the kingdom of God you are invited you are admitted come on through the gates come on in have a seat eat the choice food be with God the father at his banquet table because ultimately Jesus stands before God he points to us who have given our lives to Jesus and says they are with me and that's what Jesus is doing to you tonight. If you have given your life to Jesus, he looks at you and says, you're with me. Come on in. Come sit at the honored seat at the table. So as we continue on and conclude this message this morning, I always have three questions. And the first is, what are you putting your trust in that isn't Jesus? What is it that you, you find your security in? What is it that you find your safety in? Is it Jesus first? Is Jesus at the center and everything else we build around? Or do we sort of displace Jesus? What is that thing or person? Sometimes it's a person. 
You know, that sometimes I see struggles in marriage relationships where a husband and wife, they put so much weight on this person is going to fulfill all my wildest dreams and desires and needs. That was never that person's job. Yes, till death do us part through sickness and health, all that good stuff. But they're not Jesus. It's still in Christ alone. Jesus is first. Everything else flows from that. And a a second question is similar to that. What distracts you from relying on Christ alone? Do you get, on Sunday, maybe it's easier for you. You're singing the songs, you're hearing the message, you're with brothers and sisters in Christ. You say, okay, yeah, I can do this on Christ alone. But then you open up the news and you go, oh man, but what about Jesus? What about this? Do you know about, Jesus, do you know about this? Yeah, he does. He really does. Have you heard this? Yep, he's got it. He's got it. What distracts you from relying on Christ alone? And then finally, what idols are you setting aside so that Jesus gets first place in your life? I'll tell you, for me, um, there was about four years where I had to stop watching sports. I love football. I cannot wait till NFL training camp starts. I cannot wait till college football Saturdays start. I find it such a joy. But Amy will tell you, about 20 years ago, depending on what the score was of whatever football game, would ruin my day. It would affect how I treat my children, and and it would affect my whole mood, not just for that day, but for the next day afterwards. And Amy, bless her heart, this is back in the days of VHSs, she would record the games. Because I was at youth group being a youth pastor, you know, doing God's work, because I'm a good Christian. And she would know how the night was going to go based on what was on that videotape. And I had to get to a point, again, about 20 years ago, where I said, this is not worth it. Because I have no control who's going to run this leather ball over these painted lines on this grassy field. I have no control over that. By the way, those of you who are superstitious about sports, you don't, like, the way you wear your hat or what clothes you wear or what holy sweatshirt that you never wash, like, it, it doesn't matter. I have some really good friends who are really superstitious about sports and bless their hearts. But man, we put so much of our emotion. And yes, yeah, sports are fun because they're unpredictable and they're, you can celebrate and cheer and enjoy them. But man, does that occupy so much of your heart, so much of your affection that there's nowhere for Jesus? Does Jesus get first place? And so as we continue on with this series, that's really our calling card. And sometimes I wonder if that's what Jesus is doing with us right now in the life of this church, is that Jesus is preparing us as you welcome new people in and new faces in, is this a place that's healthy for them? Where they see that Jesus is first place? Maybe that is where we are at in our life cycle of the church. So as we respond and worship this morning, Sundays and Wednesdays and your own times with Jesus are the times for you to refocus and reset and to walk out of here with renewed focus, renewed purpose. So take that opportunity. Because you are invited. Jesus does say that you are with me. So will you respond to that love, to that grace to give him praise, to declare that he is worthy above a presidential candidate or a sports team or your visa card or your 401k. Does Jesus have the supremacy? So Jesus, guide us this morning. We say, I believe, Lord, help me in my unbelief. 
And God, we want to be a place where we're not just putting on a nice face for Sunday morning, a nice facade, because you see through all that. But God, might we worship you with abandon this morning. Might we worship you with all we have. And that we would carry that from here. To be those lights. Just like that picture that we saw. That we might live lives that make people curious. What is it about them? Why do they have that joy? Why do they have that peace? Why do they have that love? Where does that come from? How can people love like that? Not for our credit, God, but for your glory alone. Help us to lift up your name, not just in here, but in every circumstance of our lives. And we love you so very much in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and commit ourselves to this great word, shall we? And declare that we are part of the company of committed people who put Jesus first. Join all the glorious names.
Go on his power. Peace. Amen. Amen.